Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. We're delighted today to welcome the writer, filmmaker, and inspiration behind There's a Field, Jen Marlowe, who knew uh, uh, Asil Asle uh, through Seeds of Peace with her work there, and two of its activist actors, Lara Al-Qasim, Nardine's inner voice is what I call her uh, uh, in, in the film, and Darius Khalil Gordon, who played the part of Asil. And just as a quick aside, uh, any of you who have traveled with me to Palestine and Israel in our 15 solidarity tours, or any of you who have been to Palestine and been to Abuna Shakur's Mar Ilya schools in Ibelin, um, um, in the mural, you have seen a seal before because in the mural in the basement, uh, in, the, in the center of the mural, holding hands around the cross and around a picture of uh, the, uh, uh, the chapel of the Sermon on the Mount, there's Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Rachel Corey and uh, uh, a, a Christian Peacemaker team member and Asil Asle, who, as Jen was just reminding us here, went to, I think, 11th and 12th grade. Uh, at, at the high school there and was a student uh, after having visited with our very, very dear friend, Abuna Shakur, who uh, has been to Fort Wayne four times. So uh, anyway, uh, you, have run, you have met a seal before, at least through his artistic representation. So anyway, thank you all for joining us today. And Jen, uh, I'd like to begin with you. Um, the tie of your play and film is There's a Field uh, obviously based on this poem by Rumi that uh, Asil writes about in his Peaceful Thoughts. I've spoken about Rumi all over the world, frankly. Uh, uh, I, Sufism has been one of my academic uh, interests. Uh, and so I was wondering when I first heard about your film, whether there was a connection. So anyway, talk to us a little bit about how there is a field in that poem by Rumi really frames a seal's thinking and frames your film as you created it. Sure, thank you for that question, Michael. And thank you so much for organizing uh, the opportunity to have this conversation uh, with all of you. It's great, it's great to be here with you. Um, yeah, so a seal uh, loved that Rumi quote. And as you saw, you know, the, the, there's a couple pieces, different pieces of a seal's writing that are utilized um, in the play, which then is the basis of the film. And, uh, and Asil threaded that particular Rumi quote through a lot of his writing. So it was in, uh, it was the kind of organizing thought around the, the, the peace, peaceful thoughts that he wrote, but he, there's other, like the, the, the email that he wrote to um, his colleague Reem, he uses that, that quote, you know, he, 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 he clearly took some deep meaning and inspiration from that quote himself because he, he used it in a lot of his writing. Um, and, and I wanted to explore that question because I think that in many ways um, for a seal, that vision of, of the field and what that vision meant and what that represented for him um, provides the basis for the ongoing debate that a seal and Nardine have throughout um, the play. There's, there's an ideological a debate that they're having with, with much love and respect for one another, but with, with disagreement, with political ideological disagreement. And in many ways that, that quote provides the, the platform on which they're having that debate. And so that was why I, I wanted to name the play and then the film after that quote was because I think it, it got to the heart of um, some really complicated questions that they were grappling with in the context of their brother-sister relationship. Um, some of those questions address the organization, which is how I know a seal, which is yeah. Seeds of Peace. Um, and I'd actually love, it doesn't have to be right now, but at some point in this conversation, I'd love to address a little bit about my own perspectives about uh, organizations like Seeds of Peace, because um, that was part of that, that debate that a seal and Nardine uh, have throughout the play. 
So does that answer the question? Yeah, it Michael, does. About- As a matter of fact, uh, uh, um, I, I, I'm glad you referred to that because that's exactly one of the questions we're going to get to in a few in, in a few minutes, not now, but. You know, there's all kinds of controversy, not controversy, but but conversation about organizations like Seeds of Peace for all the good that they do about dialogue and all the rest. Are they are they just part of the normalization normalization process? And so anyway, we're going to we're going to put that on hold for just a few minutes because I do want to sure. get to that. Uh, it's a, it's central to the to, to the conversation. And I give you a lot of I give you a lot of credit for raising that since you're uh, 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 because you leave it hanging and 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 uh, let us kind of enter into the struggle uh, uh, between the seal and uh, Nardine. So we'll get to that in a minute. I, I'd like each one of you to uh, address this question. Here's this uh, 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 young Palestinian uh, peace activist who dies over 20 years ago. Yet his story is still resonating, not only in Palestine, but increasingly now, because of your play, uh, 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 but, but also in other venues here in our con- country, given the consciousness raising of the black and brown and indigenous lives movements uh, here in the US. Uh, especially, this is timely because of course, uh, uh, the George Floyd legislation uh, you know that's been in the news last week, the one year anniversary of Breonna Taylor's uh, murder and, of course, a rise in anti-Asian racism and violence. So uh, I'd like for each one of you maybe to say a word about Asil's legacy and uh, what your take is, right, uh, uh, about the the influence of his story on what's happening in our country today. So uh, who would like to go first? Jen, why don't you go? And then Lauren and Darius, uh, you you, uh, bring up the rear. Uh, sure, although I just spoke, so should I step oh, back okay. and let Laura... Go ahead, go ahead Jen. <laughs> go ahead, Jen. Um, all right. Um, th- thank you for, for that framing, because that, that drawing those connections are, are, is exactly what this project is hoping to do. And actually, I can go back to the previous question you asked about the field. Um, you know, in, in Asil's email, uh, Peaceful Thoughts, and, and this this part is directly quoted from in the film where he says, you know, I will go on, I will make this planet a better place to live and I will go on. Um, And for me as someone who knew and loved a seal, part of the motivation I had for this project from the start was um, trying to help make sure that those words of a seals would come true, Um, that through the play and then that that was a way um, for a seal to continue to have that impact. and I, you know, I never had the chance to ask what that Rumi quote meant to a seal. I can only guess based on on the writings he did around it. But but um, I didn't even read a lot of those writings till after he was murdered, and then those writings got recirculated and resurfaced. So I didn't have the chance to have those conversations with him. But uh, what I imagine one of the things that might have been so meaningful to him about that quote um, is the idea that there could be a place uh, that people. F- um, who come from different struggles and come from different uh, backgrounds can meet on equal terms, can meet as equal human beings, uh, where not in conditions of domination, not in condition, not in conditions of settler colonialism and oppression, but can meet um, as human beings and join together. And I think, I believe, I hope that if a seal had were to have the ability to know how his story was a part of doing that. How, how, how the telling of his story has become a platform on which different communities who are in the fight for their liberation, who are in the fight for justice for their communities, that those struggles were being connected and nurtured and strengthened through his story. Um, I, I imagine that he would love that um, and, he would, and that, that, would, that would be something he would hold dear. I, I hope that's true. Thank you, Jen. Laura? Here, let me, uh, let me, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I just put myself on mute so I won't be making too much noise. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, I think Jen said it really well. I mean, to me, I think this play is so meaningful because 
all of these things that we're hearing through the story, you know, like the very intimate recollections um, from Asil's family are really familiar, not just for Palestinians, but for people in the United States, especially, um, and elsewhere, you know, this is like not news that's foreign to us. And a lot of the images that we hear throughout the play, specific phrases from the judges or the police officers or his family, his, from his sister, um, hit really close to home. Um, I remember like when I first heard this play being read, um, my first thought was about Michael Brown. So, and just kind of having those images in my head, you know, it wasn't, I'm a Palestinian American, but that's not what it brought to my mind because that wasn't what was closest to me. So I think that, you know, that's part of what it is. And really, yeah, this ability to come together and kind of um, connect through similar experiences of oppression on, on our own terms, you know, being able to read this, this play together and really, I think, have some insight into, into other people's feelings and struggles, even if, you know, the historical context isn't always there. I think just having this very personal insight is really meaningful. And that's what kind of has made this play so accessible and useful for groups of people. Yeah. Thank you. Darius, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all um, for having me. And um, hopefully we get to see everybody on video so we can really make this a community space. Um, thank you so much, Michael, um, first of all, for having me and Jen um, and Lara. Great to see your faces. It's been too long. And unfortunately, this pandemic has uh, just really created a lot of more distance than, than I would like to really have. And um, it, it's been it's been difficult. Um, I, I um, like many have been uh, succumbed to just this pandemic. I, I lost my father in January to, to COVID. And so it's been just a very, very difficult time for, for the fam. But just, just to answer your question, I think there's been an even bigger pandemic that's been going on for a lot longer than COVID-19. And that's, that's hate. That's hate. It's straight up just those, that four letter word. And I think just having this play just really makes you walk a mile in someone else's shoes, which I think is one of the things that we can do to counteract hate, which is love. And love comes with understanding and understanding one another and understanding our backgrounds, even though um, I live in the United States and a cell lived, you know, across the pond way, you know, miles and miles away from me. Um, his story is not anything different than what we're experiencing here in America, especially with Black Lives Matter, especially with the, the incident that just happened in Atlanta that you just spoke to, Michael, and just all the other incidents. I, um, I feel as though what I don't want to happen is these things become normalized and just become an everyday kind of talk that we have just as much as we breathe. I don't want that conversation to just become something normal that we do. And so, Having these experiences and, and, and I think something bigger than just experiences is sharing the stories um, behind the experiences that, that really bring us together, I think is something that um, was really something just pivotal and, and powerful in this moment. Um, like I, I, I was able to and blessed to meet Jen through the movement. I was able to meet Laura through the movement and these things you know, stay with you for the rest of your life. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and it also just helps to inspire me and invigorate me and keep me going in this because we have to. Um, and um, just like, you know, one day I would love to just be able to walk down the street, you know, as a six, seven black man and not have to worry about certain, uh, you know, isms that are attached to me, but that's not the world that we live in. And it's 2021. Um, much like Asil had to live through when he was alive, um, much like um, a lot of our parents, and I'm including everybody on this calls. Um, I, I know you all are my elders, but <laughs> um, the civil rights movement or even movements beyond the civil rights movement, uh, we've all had to deal with this. And it's, it's, it's uh, I guess a little bit just troubling to say that, you know, this, this cycle continues and we really want to be chain breakers and we want to end this cycle because 
in order to really move on and to, to, to heal from this, we one have to do a few things. We have to take accountability for the systems and, and the systems that, that, that keep this, this going. And, and much like uh, in South, South Africa with the apartheid movement, understanding that you know, it's, not, it's not individuals who are at fault, but really the system that is really perpetuating these, these things. So we have to, one, come to grips with that. And two, have to have these hard conversations. Like there, there needs to be hard conversations in order to have that healing that we need to have. And the more the, and, and the, the greater that we try to sweep it under the rug and just really not make it our story or pass the buck, um, just really keeps the, these things going. So I think just having Jen really bring the story of Asil um, to, to life um, is something that I think is great, not only for his legacy, but for the legacy of the movement. Um, to be able to play Asil, excuse me, to be able to play Asil um, in, in this play was um, not only a blessing, but a privilege um, for me. Um, and like I said before, these are lifelong bonds that I have now with these people. So um, they'll never end. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Darius. Chain breakers. I, I, will, uh, I will use that uh, uh, myself uh, at some point. Uh, Laura, l l let me come to you with a question. Um, <clears throat> Your own personal story, uh, your support for BDS, your Supreme Court case in Israel, uh, to study there, uh, uh, her her internal struggle, right? I mean, Jen does a masterful job of. I mean, that that's central to the the story here, along with the seals, uh, uh, a story. You know, their intersection, and as Jen pointed out. It's not just a seal and Nardine, you know, those different philosophies, but you struggle. Nardine struggles within herself. Uh, she talks in the film about having to go back to Hebrew University after her brother's murder, living in Jewish society, going to school with Jewish soldiers, working at the hospital. I mean, this in many ways could be Laura's story. You know, <laughs> it, it, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, uh, maybe that's why you were asked. She feels even like she's betraying her brother by not keeping up with the struggle at the end. Uh, but she wants to get on her with her life in a, in a healthy way. And then you say in, in the film, you relate to Nardine. And so talk about your life experiences filter that you brought to your participation in the film. And, and uh, um, well, yeah, your, your life experiences filter and maybe your preparation for the part and your role. Sure. Um, thank you. That's a great question. And it's actually pretty ironic because I, at the time that the, the film took place, I hadn't been through any of those experiences, actually. We filmed, I think, in like August of 2018, and my, you know, arrival here, Supreme Court case, everything was actually in October of 2018. So just the reverse of how I put it. So, oh yes. So in what? some ways, though, that made it a little bit, uh, I think, every, you know, it almost makes it more interesting in my head, at least, because um, part of what I was going through at that time was this decision of attending Hebrew University and whether that was the right decision for me, which is the university that in the play Nardine is attending. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, that was kind of what I was thinking at the time, you know, I, I knew I wanted to, to be here, which is, I'm here now in Jerusalem. Um, I knew I wanted to be here. And I didn't, and, you know, there were different reasons why, and I didn't want it all to be, you know, such a heavy political decision just to be able to come to the place that my family is from. And of course, it ended up being even more of a heavy political decision than I envisioned when I arrived and I was, you know, being deported and all of these different things. So, um, yeah, I definitely continued to relate to kind of the conversation that Nardine has. Um, I think that's really what I, I should have mentioned in, when you asked the first question, but I think that's an, another really important facet and Darius brought it up and so did Jen. Um, yeah, this conversation about what does it mean to be compassionate and empathetic towards individuals and you know the everyday person who you might see and love but fundamentally disagree with and addressing the real structures and being able to draw those connections across 
the world to to be chain breakers and to break the structures of oppression. Um, yeah, I think I think um, that you know a lot of that was heavy on my mind when I arrived. Also, this kind of sense of betrayal, having you know there were different um, responses to my court case from different groups of people, and I think you know having these large scale you know structures that give different people different rights to do and say different things results not only in you know these massive acts of violence but also as Nardine shows in her conversation with herself of um well I just want to live my life and I don't want to raise a miserable family you know I want to have a nice home and a, a family that loves me and that I can love I think she's really showing kind of the daily wear and tear of not being able to make a decision and not feel the guilt of, you know, you're not doing enough or you're doing too much. You're putting something else at risk. You know, um, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely, I think that it's not just me, you know, I think any of us who are really trying to kind of address these injustices and draw the connections and do what we can to be as serious and so beautifully chain breakers. Um, I think it, that's one of the major um, impacts. And I love that that's included in the play because I also go back as, as, um, as uh, Mar Marquis said in the end, how he, this is kind of a conversation that he has with himself, like, addressing things directly and having compassion and empathy and kind of, you know, going between these two ideas in his head, how to, how to be, I think that's something that a lot of us struggle with. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, uh, very much, Laura. Darius, uh, um, I want to address this question to you. You, you bring a lifetime of community organizing and work on behalf of fair housing, workers' rights, criminal justice reform, political campaigns, and more to your, uh, to, 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 not, what, and not without a little bit of controversy, but uh, to, to your role as, as a SEAL. Um, your, your two quotes in the movie, you know, are, are two, two of your quotes in the movie, being black in America, we know the anti-apartheid movement, we all love Nelson Mandela, etc. And then closer to the end, white privilege, black people in the hood, these things happen, the cameras come, and then when everything dies down, they go, etc. I mean, these are very powerful, powerful uh, 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 soliloquies uh, that you speak in the film. And I guess I, I want you to just it's the same question I asked Laura. How, talk to us about your life experiences as a filter uh, as you come to playing the character of a SEAL. Yeah, thank you. And uh, my, wow, you make me sound so like <laughs> crazy like <laughs> with the resume, but I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, I want something that actually Laura kind of alluded to in her, her talks like, the reason why I think her character wants to just have this normal life is because that's her privilege. And that's what she is like. She, she deserves that. It's not like these mantles that we have to take because we do have to take them because everybody isn't, you know, many hands. If, uh, there's a saying many hands make light work, you know, so if we all take a little bit of a piece of this puzzle and try to put it together, we're actually taking a lot of work and stress off of other people's back who we, we delegate this work too. And so what I mean by those two quotes is, I think there's a lot of romanticizing that happens um, just because it is a good story or something that people can kind of just say, oh man, isn't that sad? And, and, and they can donate their, their buck. Don't, don't get me wrong, like donations, they help a great, a great amount. And please, like, <laughs> if you can, please donate to the movement. However, um, just, making those people feel good just about doing that isn't enough is what yeah. I'm, it was, is what I mean. And I think just in those two quotes, one, one thing about me, um, my father, uh, my, my stepfather um, is a former Black Panther. And so um, growing up from the age of 14, 
Um, <laughs> all I wanted to do, I, like I said, I'm six, seven. All I wanted to do was play basketball and like play video <laughs> games and like watch cartoons when I was younger. Unfortunately, um, I mean, but fortunately for me, he was like, you can't, you can't, you can't, there's work to be done. Um, and from a very young age, I think I was thrown into a lot of just things that I was like, what is this? And just like really politicized at a young age to, to really, I guess, mold and shape me to the person that I am today. Um, I, went to, I went to Penn State for college and I, I wanted to just become a lawyer, and, you know, after I knew my basketball dream wasn't gonna happen. Um, but he made me change my major to African and African uh, American studies, quoting, and I quote, you will not go to a predominantly white school and not know about yourself. You will not be lost in a lot of these other people's stories and, and, and assumptions of what you should be wow. in, in this world. And I think that really has a profound effect for why I do this work is because the torch has been passed. And if you don't pick it up, you know, it's just, it's just gonna lay on the ground and that doesn't do justice for anyone. And so I think just with that being said, knowing that this teenager, this teenager who I think was very wise ab uh, above, uh, above his years, like even though he was 17 in the play, he sounds like a like a fifty year old, you know. No, no offense to, <laughs> to anybody who's gone, no ageism, but but in terms of just the wisdom, like he was a very profound young man, and he wasn't seen as a teenager. He was seen as someone that people could look up to and go to for advice, for leadership, for a shoulder to cry on, for just anything to make sure that they felt better about what they were doing, and someone who who can be a crux sometimes, even though they don't see themselves as powerful, is probably the most powerful person in the room. And I think Asil not only embodied that, but is very obvious through Jen having, having met him, through his family members, through just how his death had an impact on the town that he grew up in, you know? And I think for most of us, just like in the Black community, if we're talking about Trayvon Martin, if we're talking about George Floyd, if we're talking about anyone, they are a, 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 a now a foundation, another, not just a rock, but a, a, a stone and, 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 a, and, a, and a formidable person who will go on into the ethos from here on out because of just their sacrifice that they had, they had to give. And that's so unfortunate because they, just like everybody else that God created in this, in this world, is entitled to a life of freedom, entitled to a life of happiness, entitled to a life of love, and entitled to a life that they should not have to. But we don't live in that world. We don't. And so I think the buck just needs to keep going because we, we still need to have, have, like I said, these conversations. We still need to stand up um, because there is a lot of work to be done. Thanks so much, Darius. I'm going to come to Jen, you next. Uh, uh, but uh, I just want to say, Darius, that I don't know everybody on the screen here, but for most of us, 50 is still pretty young. So uh, uh, it was okay. It was okay what you said, just so you know. Uh, Jen, I, I, I want you to tell us your story and, and what brought you to, I mean, you knew a seal, of course. But uh, let's let's get into the whole, uh, you brought this up early. Let's get into the whole conversation about Seeds of Peace. It's clear, right, that Seeds of Peace was formative uh, for, for a seal. Uh, he stays in touch with his friends, his, his poignant conversation with his sister. Uh, he, he's buried in the Seeds of Peace shirt. Some of his Seeds of Peace Jewish friends come. And as I said earlier, one of, one of the strengths, I think, of your film is that you let us make up our own minds about the efficacy of of seeds of peace. On the one hand, how can anyone argue that Israelis and Palestinians getting to know each other and becoming friends is a bad thing, right? Uh, on the other hand, they return to an apartheid state where Israeli kids become soldiers enforcing ethnic cleansing policies. Uh, so seeds of peace can become a part of the normalization apparatus that supports an unjust status quo. So Jen, to talk to us about, mm -hmm. you know, your life experience filter that you bring to the, that you, that, that made you want to tell this story in addition just to knowing a seal and then address 
the whole seeds of peace uh, uh, conversation that you wanted to talk about before. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So a small question, my whole life story. And yeah, <laughs> yeah just to, just to yeah, summarize it in a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. I, I would be so happy to do that. Before I do that, I just want to say, first of all, Darius, interesting that you brought up the age of 50, because I'm literally um, starting tomorrow morning, beginning to hike my final 570 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail, which is this 2,600 mile trail. I've been hiking it as a fundraiser for kids in Gaza, whose medical care I support. And I've hiked 2,000 miles, 570 left to go, and I'm planning it to reach the border with Mexico on my 50th birthday, uh, which actually, and I share a birthday with a seal. Um, so when you said that, I was just thinking of that. Well, I'm glad and you I'll, said something about your, I, I was going to ask you later on to share about it. So I mean, I'm glad that you said something now that you, for, you're going to take this little stroll for your 50th birthday. So uh, great. Little, 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 <laughs> little, little 570 mile stroll. Um and, and Darius, also, like, thank you so much for sharing with us what your family went through. I didn't know till you said it right now about your dad. And it just also is making me realize that that means that we haven't been in contact in several months and that that's, um, and I wish we had been because I love you. And I consider you and Lara, you know, family and everyone who's been in this together. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about movement building on this call. And I think that movement building um, is based on strong, it's, it's, it's relationships. That's what it, you know, <laughs> that's what it is first and foremost. It's relationships between people, it's relationships between struggles. Um, and um, yeah, you're just reminding me that I haven't been in enough contact because um, I would have known what you've been through if I had been. Um, and I just want you to know that I love you. Um, uh, Michael, to, to answer. Thank, thank you, Jen, and love you as well. Love you all. Thank you. Um, Laura, yeah, also even you sharing what you went through with um, your whole court case, I was just flashing back to like getting text messages from you when you were detained at Ben Gurion when it was like the very, very like first hours of that ordeal. And we were like trying to figure out what support you, you know, we could get you. And so just lots of, we have a lot of history together, all of us. Um, in really beautiful we certainly ways. Do. <laughs> um, and and part of my personal history did involve Michael, as you were referencing that, you know, I knew a seal because I used to work for Seeds of Peace. And and I would say that um, the time that I spent living in Palestine when I worked for Seeds of Peace, which was from 2000 to 2004, I met a seal at the camp, Seeds of Peace camp in 1999. Uh, and then I moved to Jerusalem just a few more few months before a seal was murdered in the summer of 2000 to continue working for Seeds of Peace there. And then I was there for four years. Um, and those four years were absolutely the four of the most formative years in my life. And I would say largely because of a seal's murder. I don't think I recognized it at the time. That probably took me 10 years before I fully recognized how much a seal's murder was a turning point in my life. Um, I recognized immediately the, that that I, you know, the impact of losing someone I loved, right? Like the, the the grief and the trauma and that aspect of it, I understood very quickly. But the, but the way in which um, my worldview um, shifted around that event, the way in which my understanding of power and privilege and how and how power and privilege operates, how settler colonialism operates, how that how it's connected all over the world, like all of that, my whole um, political uh, journey uh, was really set in motion, I would say, by a seal's murder. And there's there's been other events since then that have been similarly defining in my own political evolution, including the execution of Troy Davis in, in 2011. Um, uh, and and all that brought many other layers of understanding uh, in terms of the US context. Um, and I think the critiques that I have about organizations like Seeds of Peace really, really grow out of having seen it operate, you know, having been a part of it, of, of its operation for many years. Um, for folks who maybe aren't familiar with the, with the term normalization, although I think this is probably a, a group of folks that have been engaged in these issues, but just, uh, just to not make any assumptions that um, uh, there's different ways that, that normalization can be defined. A, a way that I think it's useful to defining it is, is when any effort to make relationships seem as if they're normal, right? Uh, uh, without actually addressing the structural oppression that is undergirding those relationships. 
so that if we're if we're if we're just focused on like let's all get along but not deal with the fact that like there's an occupation and not deal with the fact that like there's dominance and oppression then that's normalization yeah. um and i and i do think that oh sorry did someone want to were you going to say something no, michael please. oh um and i do think that programs like seeds of peace are a part of that um and of course is it is it a beautiful thing to think about people seeing each other as human beings um and imagining that they can they can um see each other and form these relationships of course it's lovely and i've witnessed many beautiful moments of young beautiful young people beautiful israeli young people beautiful palestinian young people meeting and connecting with each other and it and it does warm the heart and also it's dangerous and damaging to the liberation work i think if it doesn't address because it doesn't address the underlying structural oppression um out of the hundreds of Israeli young people that I met, um, certainly a lot, they were impacted uh, by Seeds of Peace. And a lot of them were, you know, a lot of them were absolutely, um, they would listen to stories from their Palestinian colleagues about abuses, for example, that, that, that folks had faced um, at checkpoints at the hands of Israeli soldiers. And I would say um, the vast, vast majority of those Israeli young people would think to themselves, well, I, I don't want, if I'm a soldier at that checkpoint, I'm going to make sure that, that, uh, that, that I am treating people with dignity, right? But only the tiniest fraction of them questioned whether they had the right to be at that checkpoint to begin with, to, to question whether that checkpoint had the right to exist, question what, regardless of whether or not they were going to treat the person in front of them humanely or abusively, only a handful of them questioned whether they had the right to control another population's freedom of movement. And unless, and so I'm, it's not that I, it's not that I'm against joint work. I, you know, I, I've been involved in a lot of projects of Israelis and Palestinians doing joint work, but in my mind, it has to be work that is very directly about confronting the structures of power and privilege, dismantling those structures and replacing them with structures of actual, actual equity and that support actual uh, decolonization. Um, and organizations like Seeds of Peace don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for thanks thanks for that, Jen. I, I should mention everyone that we're recording this conversation, and if you'd like to show, uh, if you'd like to screen, there's a field for one of your groups. Uh, you can check uh, with Jen Marlowe, and Jen, you'll you'll give us your contact information in the chat room, and also at the end of the uh, and at the end of the film, we uh, at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace will post this interview on our uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel within the next couple of days. So you can rewatch it at that point to hear Jen and Lara and Darius uh, again, if you'd like. Um, I want, I, I wanna, I wanna move to a question that's been asked in the chat room. You've already touched on this, the three of you, uh, the film opens with these words. This is about our humanity, about our basic rights, freedom, struggles that touch every part of our lives. And then you say, it says, state sanctioned violence and the resistance that's needed to fight against it. So there's a question in the chat room about US police uh, and, and, and other security uh, forces being trained by Israeli military and Israeli police. Um, uh, so this idea of state-sanctioned violence at the heart of the parallel stories in Palestine, Israel, and in the U.S. And as the film puts it, you know, villainize, he, he gets villainized for being part of at, at the demonstration. He gets criminalized. And I can't remember who says it, but the police have guns. He has his voice. The government of Israel, of America, that's terrorizing us. Um say a word about state sanctioned violence uh the the police state and and the inner the intersection between the police state of israel and the police state in the united states and all three of you can weigh in on this who would like to go first um, I'll, I'll go first this time thanks darius yeah um, I, I i i'll speak from just my experiences um just a lot of times the the, the state sanctioned violence um often is victim blaming well what did they do to, to get themselves in that situation, you know, what what did what did they say to the police? You know, wh why did they have to resist? You know, instead of why is the police officer abusing this person? Why are they actually enticing, 
you know, th this type of uh, reaction so that their reactions are now justified. Um, the same thing we see, you know, in, in, the, in the Middle East. I, I, I'll share just a quick story. When, when I went to Palestine um, and I was in the airport, um, they didn't call me Darius. They called me Khalil because they were like, OK, we're assuming you're Muslim because you have a Muslim middle name. So I was like, no, I, I'm Darius, Darius Khalil Gordon. My mom gave me that middle name for a reason. But no, I'm, I'm Darius. I, I was born in, in Washington, D.C., you know, I, but, but for them, it's already the separation of the other. Let's create this, this separation. Let's not see this person as for what he is. You know, they wouldn't even acknowledge my whole name. And so I think just the state sanction is this kind of still sense of these people aren't human and we're not going to treat them like that. And, and that would already create this type of dichotomy where it's an us versus them type of, type of mentality. And anything that they do in terms of the state sanctioned violence is justified because these people aren't human. So therefore, any of our of our actions are justified because these are not humans that we're dealing with. And I think that has been the case in this country since the enslavement of, of our people in West Africa, where the three fourth, the three fifths, excuse me, the three fifths deal, you know, in terms of how voting takes takes place and still that sense of the popular versus, you know, the, we, we can get into that democratic vote and, and have that for another conversation. But there are still, the, the roots in this country are still very, very deep, very deep. Even uh, uh, this past week when uh, the officer was talking about uh, the shooting in Atlanta, him just saying, oh, well, that guy was having a bad day. And just, yeah. you know, kind of just, you know, he, he was having a bad day and he wasn't there mentally. How much of a different conversation that would, would be if that person was any person of color, if, especially if he had the skin that I have. So I think, again, it's, it's a lot of work to be done. And, and, and we don't want to acknowledge that because we don't want to acknowledge these people as human beings. We don't want to acknowledge ourselves as the people who are doing the wrong. We don't want to acknowledge that. We want to justify it, which is a very different kind of conversation of accountability than if we start to see ourselves in that. So I'll stop right there. Thank you, Darius. Laura, Jen? I can go if that's okay, Jen. I was just, I was actually gonna get off mute to invite you to go, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so please. Yeah, I think Darius, you know, put it very well, um, of course. Um, but I think also, you know, related to what he's saying is kind of, you know, I saw, I'll, I'll tell you something I saw on Twitter, you know, there was a couple of days ago, there was a, a young woman who was murdered in London and the person who is the alleged, you know, the suspect is a police officer. Right. And so they had a vigil for this woman in London and in response, a lot of people I think were arrested and brutalized by the police. And I didn't see too much about it, but I was just looking on Twitter and I saw a lot of the comments and a lot of the comments were saying, well, the law is that they shouldn't be protesting. This is COVID, we're in a pandemic, da, 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 da. <laughs> um, and I hear that a lot here too, right? You say like, well, someone's home got demolished. That's awful. And then someone says, well, it's the law they built illegally. And so I think, you know, this is kind of what Darius was bringing up in the beginning, these acts of brutality and also what, what James brought up in the film, like these acts of brutality become so normalized and we become so desensitized to them. And part of it is, you know, this idea of law, who controls the law, what does the law say? And not so much conversation, um, as Jen kind of brought up as well, of like, well, who's writing the law? Why does the law say that? Why is the law working in such a way that it leads to the demolition of homes or people not being able to publicly mourn someone that they lost without fear of violence? So, you know, I think when we talk about state sanctioned violence, what it like boils down to at the end of the day is who does the law serve and why <laughs> why does it work like that and why do we continue to allow it to operate that way and I just wanted to say um, as well because I did see that question posted and I think it's a great question you know to further you know 
probe these um, kind of um, similarities of state sanctioned violence and the way that kind of um, law in one place and the way that law is unjust in one place is used to um, perpetuate unjust laws in another place. That's very important. But I think at the same time, I also wanted to mention that, you know, the United States, as Jerry said as well, has been dehumanizing people through the law for a long time, <laughs> much longer than Israel has existed. So I think also sometimes we get caught up in this question of like, oh, well, how is Israel leading to additional policing in the United States? And I think it's important to acknowledge as well, the United States knows how to police and how to use brutality and doesn't need encouragement, right? We should, I think it's important to bring that up as well. So of course, like that's not to say, you know, like I said, this, this parallel idea of unjust laws is definitely important and the way that they influence each other. But I just wanted to bring that point up as well. Thank you. Uh, Jen, we're going to come to you, but it's important. I just want to read uh, what Lynn Huber wrote uh, in the chat room. On my last trip to Palestine, Israel, I met a higher up policeman from Chicago on his way there for training. They know how to do it, and they're lucky they have the Palestinians to practice on. And so, yeah, those of us in the movement have met cops from the U.S. who have been trained by Israeli military and uh, um, uh, so, so that really resonates, that kind of sentiment. Uh, so thank you, Lynn, for that. Jen? Yeah, and, and just um, for folks who want some more information about um, this, uh, the, the, pol the interaction between those police forces, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, I think with other movement allies, have a, a campaign focused on the deadly exchange, which is just that, which is looking at the, um, the exchanges between these, those police forces. Um, Darius and Larry, you just both spoke so um, powerfully about uh, about this these the the deep the deep connections of state sanctioned violence. Um, Laura, when you were talking about the courts and the law, uh, I was reminded of um, uh, I think our first residency, Nadia Ben Yusuf um, was with us, and uh, my friend Nadia Ben Yusuf, who's who's now she's the advocacy director for Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, uh, and she was the founder of Adala Justice Project. She's a human rights lawyer who talk, who speaks about how she, she used to think that law was a powerful tool and has come to understand instead that law is a tool of the powerful. Uh, and I think that speaks, you know, what you were saying, Laura, speaks so much to that. Um, like Darius said, and like Laura emphasized, state sanctioned violence um, is part of the founding. Uh, it, it's of, of both of both Israel's founding um, and also the U.S. founding. And even and even before the enslavement of people from Africa, this country was founded on the genocide of its indigenous peoples. Um, and and so it's um, and then it was built, you know, through the exploitation of labor from from enslavement. Um, in Africa, so so settler colonization, uh, you know, combined with capitalism, have always been like have always been the structures of white supremacy, um, and and those get implemented by the law and implemented by the court and enforced, you know, and then of course the criminal punishment system. The police are the foot soldiers of the criminal punishment system. I, I no longer want to call it a criminal justice system because I don't want to um, give the idea that there's any actual justice involved in that system. Um, so I, I think when we're having these conversations about state violence, it's also really important to interrogate what's the frame that we're using. Because I think often, um, I think conversations about state violence are, are in this frame of, are, are undertaken in a frame of citizenship as, as if the issue is that like we, you know, we are just looking for equal rights as citizens. Um, and, and I think that's a problematic frame uh, in both the US context and, and certainly also the Palestinian context. Um, I think the frame has to include like um, uh, decolonization uh, and decolonization. It doesn't just mean, you know, trying to get the same rights as it's actually like dismantling the very the very foundations the the colonial foundations that um that these societies are based on and reimagining re-envisioning um re-envisioning new ways that we are in relationship to each other as a society new ways that we're operating um uh, and functioning as a society in the most fundamental ways uh, and i think conversations about state violence um yeah, I, I think we always need to be interrogating 
um, the frame that we're bringing to those questions. You know, you thank you, Jen. You bring that up in the film, I think, pretty well when you talk about the uh, the the results of the Or Commission. Uh, it's the official Israeli inquiry into the killing of these twelve Palestinian citizens, including a seal, and they basically, you know, reach uh, a conclusion that yes, uh, he was he he was shot and killed, but we don't know how and why and who. I mean, it just really kind of left up in the air. And and you say it very poignantly. Uh, I think it's one of the family members in in the film. There's justice. And then there's justice for Arabs. There's no resolution. It's left an open wound. And uh, uh, that open, I mean, I, I, under, I, I understood the first part of that, right? There's justice and there's justice for Arabs. And that's true. But, but what really resonated with me was when, when you said, or when they said, and all you're left with is an open wound. And that, that just, hangs there right it just hangs there and for for families who are who continue to deal with this throughout the rest of their lives and whole communities right and and peoples so this idea of two different kinds of justice if even you want to call the one justice right and that and that was amber murchison uh, who's one of the performers who makes that reflection and and she's talking about how she felt uh confronting the Orr Commission, the lack of indictment in a seal story and how much that reminded her of how she felt when there was no indictment um, for, the, for the murder of, uh, of Michael Brown by police officer Darren Wilson. Um, and that's when she talked about feeling that there was no, there's no resolution, it was just an open wound. And I think again, it's like, it's interrogating the frame of state violence. If, we, if we're looking to the state, if we're looking to the perpetuators of the violence, as the ones uh, to bring justice um, for the act of violence, then <laughs> it's going to happen. The, exactly the the structure. It's you know who who are these courts meant to protect? Who are these courts? Who are these laws um, uh, meant to protect? They were never meant to protect a seal and his family. They were never meant to protect um, Michael Brown and his family. Um, so who are they meant to protect? Who who write like Laura said? Who's who writes the laws and for and for whose benefit and for and and that and so until that is addressed, um, then there will always be families who are stuck in the cycle of having to seek just you know being being told that the only way they can seek justice is by literally going to the same systems that perpetrated the violence against them to begin with. Um, and, and sometimes I think about the work that I do, not just with the SEAL story, but also uh, with so many families that I partnered with, that in amplifying their stories, um, that perhaps that is some kind of alternative form of justice, because at least they're not needing then to rely on the perpetrators to be the arbiters of the truth telling. If, if part of this, the seeking for justice is 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 a desire to to um, have the truth be known, and I, and I think for many families that is part of their quest for justice is about this truth telling, um, then at the very least um, that's something that uh, we can provide for each other as a community. We don't have to rely um, on the perpetrators of oppression to be the to be the ones to to say whether or not folk stories are true or what the truth is. Thank you, Darius. Yeah, yeah. Just just to add to that, um, and I, I think oh, Laura, could it? Go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, she she muted herself. Um, and no, I just have a tiny thing to add, but I'll I can say it after you say, Darius. Thank yeah. you, yeah, Darius. <laughs> go ahead. J just to add to to Jen's point, I think there's another thing in terms of the open wound and. What, what we have here in America um, are usually settlements for like, you know, a few million for the family to deal with, but that doesn't even come out the police, the police's budget that comes out of the taxpayers money. So they're not even getting hit with anything in terms of uh, like a, a slap on the wrist or anything that that can kind of take away from this 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 violence because it's not their money that they're they're having to use. It's our own money from our own communities to pay back you know, these people, you know, I think in Chicago, Chicago is a very good example of that, where there's millions of dollars, but not millions from the police budget or police union. And here in New York City, we're trying to, to get $1 billion from a $6 billion budget 
one one billion. That's all we're asking for from a six billion dollar budget from the New York City New New York City Police Department. So when we're talking about like really breaking down these systems, it's an open wound because the people who are are creating this violence aren't affected by it, and we continue this this cycle of it. That, that's all I wanted to add. So, sorry, Laura. No, thank you, Darius. Go ahead, Laura. No, yeah, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Um, no, I just wanted to add, you know, every time I watch this film, I see something new. And, and this time what I saw, and I don't think this was intentional, but um, because, you know, multiple people played multiple roles. And so Jen, you cast James as both the policeman who um, threatens Jamila at one point because she's, you know, I think someone, I don't, I don't remember exactly what it is, but there's the scene where James is looking into the camera and kind of saying like, you need to shut your mother up before we arrest her. And then he's also the one who reads the decision of the Orr Commission. So he's also kind of playing this judge, which I found so symbolic of this, you know, who is carrying out the law and who is determining the law again, right? Who's making the decisions about what was right and wrong when injustice is carried out. Um, I don't think that was intentional, was it? But it was great. <laughs> well, it, that was that was not, not my decision. Heather Holmes was directing the performance. So that right. Heather did the casting. Right, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank we you can for... ask Heather if that was intentional. <laughs> this is a question I'd like for uh, uh, whoever would like to address this, but uh, one of the sub themes of the film kind of comes up it, it, it's hinted at throughout, but then at the end, it, it's made very uh, tangible. Women of the women of color around the world feel the brunt of the pain, but then they're at the lead of the resistance. You want to say a word about that? I see you nodding, Darius. Go for it. I mean. Like we, like I was just saying, the the, the guy in Atlanta have, has a bad day. I think women of color, <laughs> they don't they don't have just that that room to even say I'm having a bad day. Like t I'm taking a break. Like these are are the like my mom or my aunt or my sisters. Like it, it's it's so much of 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 just the labor that they have to take on, um, and I think it's unfortunate because they are the ones who aren't the voices for the most part, or excuse me, I shouldn't say that, but a, a lot of their stories aren't heard. A lot of their stories aren't being told. Um, they're being overshadowed or just get over it. Or, you know, you, you, you can, you know, for, forget about that. You know, it's, it's always dismissed. And I think that that's really just been like a hit, like a throughout history, that's been just the narrative. And I think something, just one thing, I think it's, it's brave for them to just have to take on that. Um, but it's another thing and it's just really unfortunate because again, they don't they don't get the chance to say no and, and to take a break because society doesn't allow them, you know, when others do get that opportunity. So um, it's, it's really um, just disheartening. And, and I, I feel as though, you know, I, I want that to change if, if, if anything, you know, I think if we really, and, and not just women, I think trans people as well, you know, their, their stories don't, aren't told as well. So I, I think, you know, they're, they're man, I, I don't want to play oppression Olympics, but at the same time, like really the disenfranchised need to be heard because there's a lot of healing to do. So I'll just stop there. Thank you, Darius. Either one of the, uh, Jen or Laura? If you have, Laura, go for it. Okay, yeah, go quickly. Um, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I don't know what I can really add. I feel like we know a lot of this, right? But I think, you know, one of the things that um, I think is true, right? <laughs> of course, I agree. You know, women are often, especially women of color, are often doing so much of the work and get so little of the, you know, good things out of that, the recognition or the pay or, you know, whatever that is. Um, and, and a lot of the worst parts of it, the danger and the aggression and, you know, 
um, and the exhaustion. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think like even in my own context here and back home in the United States, you know, you see women doing a lot of um, the big work behind the scenes, right? There's like a poem about it, about nobody wants to do the dishes. Like everyone wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. And women are kind of a lot of times picking up that slack. Um, and it's about like, how do we value labor and like who's, you know, whose labor do we give value to? Do we like point out as valuable? Um, sometimes it's all of the stuff that we don't see that makes what we can see happen. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think it's true. And I think we, you know, th there's ways that we can address that in organizational spaces, right? By thanking people publicly or, you know, in private spaces and, um, trying to help out lift some of that labor off of their shoulders in ways that we can. Yeah. Thank you. I've got just, uh, we, I'm aware of the time. And so I've just got a couple more questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up. I, Jen, not now, but when, when we wrap up, I, I really hope that you'll say something more about Donkey Saddle uh, uh, Productions and the other films and plays that 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 uh, are, are available through Donkey Saddle because we want to give you time to give a commercial later on. So- uh, uh, I will not refuse. <laughs> uh, seal writes in his peaceful thoughts about not forgetting, but forgiving. And this opens up an entire conversation, right? About what in religious terms we call repentance, but what you call about, what you what, what the film talks about is acknowledging the crimes. What in South Africa, you know, was called truth and reconciliation, right? Uh, um, not reconciliation without the acknowledgement of a, a fault, a wrong, a, a sin, you know? Uh, so I want you to say a word about that in the SEAL story and here in the US. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's part of that ongoing debate between a SEAL and our Dean, right? So a SEAL is writing in peaceful thoughts, we should never forget, but we should forgive. And Nardine responds by saying, we can't even start forgiving until there's at least the smallest step towards acknowledgement of the crimes that were done in your case, in your murder in specific, and to the nation, to the Palestinian nation in general. So yeah, before you can even begin to talk about forgiveness or any any other language of moving on, um, there can not, you know, how can there be any ability to move on when the wrongdoing, A, has not been addressed, and B, is still ongoing, right? So it's not even a wrongdoing that's in the past that is being, you know, overlooked. It's a wrongdoing in the past that's being overlooked and that wrongdoing is being done again and again and again all the way until the present. Um, and so, yeah, if we're in the U.S. context, uh, if we're talking about um, uh, if we're talking about reparations, if we're talking about like, you know, land back movement for indigenous communities, like we we have to acknowledge and address um, wrongs that were done and are being done again and again and again until today um, before before any conversations of you know how to move forward or visions for moving forward all of that has to be in in Palestine in the US and globally um, they it has I believe it has to be absolutely founded with um, with an honest grappling of what have what were the wrongs that have been done and acknowledgement of them um, a commitment to stop doing them, to dismantle the structures that are perpetuating them, um, and addressing how to rectify them, addressing the harms that were done, Addr um, and, and letting the people who are most impacted by those harms to lead that process and to follow their lead. Thank you. Why don't we wrap up with uh, uh, one last question here. Um, Each one of you in your own personal work and in addition to the, the film itself, but in your own personal activism, it kind of gives witness to one of the things that said it near the end of the, the film. We're not gonna win alone. So it's important to know who's in the struggle with you. And the, it talks about creating a global movement. You know, move, it, micro, you know, in, in, in communities, 
beginning in families and communities in uh, uh, you know and, and moving out moving out moving out further and further to build a global movement with uh, uh, fellow activists and with you know with people who uh, are, are open to the other and who want to embrace the other. Uh, let, let's use that as our closing question. Would each one of you want to take a whack at that one? Laura? <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, I, could you just maybe put the question into one sentence so sure. I know that I'm- we're, we're not gonna win this alone. And so it's important to know who's in the struggle with you, creating a global movement. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, the way that we need to move forward towards liberation, right, is kind of what we've been talking about all of this time, you know, we, we can all relate to these similar phrases and experiences through things we've either experienced ourselves or seen through other people around us. And so, um, what also what, you know, what Darius said earlier of like, we know the history of South African apartheid. We know what's been happening in the United States since its conception. We know what's happening here. And it's hard to see it happen again and again and again. So in order to do that, we really do need this kind of global movement to restructure everything, you know, restructure states, restructure laws, restructure systems um, to ensure equality for, for all people. Thank you. Darius? Um, I, I think that's a very good question and I wish I had an hour to, to answer that question. Um, but in, in terms of just a, a very short answer, I think it's really like uh, uh, Martin Luther King said, you know, it's not times of when things are going great, but when, when things are going rough, you know, you really see who, who really has your back. And I think in, in cases where we're seeing just people getting killed left and right, whether it be from a, a pandemic or state sanctioned violence, this is not a reality TV show. This is not a movie. This is real life. And I think we are going through that, that time where it's very tumultuous right now, not only here, but across the world. And we need to start, we need to stop. We need to maybe be quiet for a little bit, open our ears and have very low egos, but very high impact. Very low egos, but very high impact. And, and I mean that because once we start to put ourselves in other people's shoes, even if those experiences aren't safe or say tit for tat, we've all felt what it's like to grieve or, or feel some type of, of wrongdoing. We've all felt that. So to say, to, to start there, I think is a start. And we can really build a beautiful thing once we actually recognize that first. And that, that'll come with a lot of, you know what, my bad. That will come with a lot of, you know what, I, I messed up right there. You know what, and, and that, th those little things about what we were talking before about not forgetting, but, but forgiving, it's also forgiving yourselves for the things that you may not have done, but <laughs> it could have been <laughs> a generation of your, your forefathers or, or foremothers or, or someone like that doing. And so taking that accountability, just like how general, uh, generational wealth is passed down, there are other things that are passed down as well. And so I think we really have to acknowledge that take a step back and, and listen, and, and, and we'll, we'll get there. We will get there. Thank you, Darius. Jen, you wanna take that one or you will wait for your closing comments to make a summary statement? Um, I mean, I, I, I can just, I don't know that I have more that I could really add to, to um, the thoughts that, that Darius and Lara offered. Um, I'm, I'm grateful Lynn in the chat, so many people have been contributing really wonderful thoughts in the chat. And I'm grateful to Lynn Huber for referencing uh, Myanmar and, and China and, and yep. making sure that we're in our frame that we're remembering and holding other, other places where people are, are facing um, horrific repression um, and are resisting that. Um, and I'll, I'll just, you know, the only thing I'll, I'll add to what Darius and, and Lara said is that I, my, I believe deeply that, um, that struggles uh, for liberation and struggles for equity um, are strengthened by being in relationship to each other. But that's, but that's deep, um, 
that's deep work and it's and it's hard work and it can be messy work and and I really appreciated that 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 Darius talked about high impact low ego and that and that there you know that we have to approach this work with with deep humility um and and with really being prepared to learn from each other um and 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 to do the deep listening and that can be messy and that can be painful and if it's not then you're not doing the real work. Thanks for that, Jen. A number of folks uh, have been asking in the chat room for your contact information. And I, I think what I'm going to suggest is that uh, they contact Jen at Donkey Saddle. Uh, and then uh, if they have if they want to con connect with you, Darius, or you, Lara, they go through Jen on that. I, I don't want to put yeah. that on you, Jen, but I, I think that's probably the best way to do it. I, yeah. I, I'm a little uncomfortable just tossing out contact sure. information broadly. That form, this form that I just dropped is actually the best way because then you can like write your name, your email. Um, it gives an opportunity for reflections on this event, but also to let us know how you want to stay in touch. And then you can write on that form, I really want to reach Darius. And then I can like facilitate that. That will be, that will be the best way for me to be able to like um, get everyone uh, the contacts that they want and, you know, uh, and, and follow up. So please uh, go to the chat room and uh, either cut and paste that that link or, you know, you can go to that form uh, uh, immediately to the, it's sort of a feedback form. And so it's an important, it's important for Jen. Uh, 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 and it's also a way for her to keep in contact with those of you who want to do that. So let me just, uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to give each one of our guests uh, a time to close. But before I do, I want to just uh, um, um, say that uh, on Wednesday, March 31st at 2 Eastern Time, we'll be hosting our friend from the UK, Robert Cohen, one of the foremost British commentators on Palestine and Israel. We'll be discussing a whole host of issues, including his, his recent blog, We Need to Decolonize Our Understanding of Anti-Semitism. On Saturday, April 3rd, the day before Easter, we're co-sponsoring with other organizations, the Easter service hosted by FASNA, the Friends of Sabil, with Jean Zaru, Nora Carmi, Sabil's father, Naeem Atik, and a sermon by Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign. And then on Wednesday, April the 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be talking to our very dear friend, uh, Daoud Nasser, uh, one of our mission partners, by the way, at Indiana Center, Daoud Nasser from Tent of Nations. They're under increasing pressure from the Israeli government, neighboring settlers, and local Palestinian villagers. The motto of their form, farm is, we refuse to be enemies. So we hope you'll share the news of our interviews with your friends. And again, I'll just repeat that uh, this interview, along with the 30 or 40 other interviews that we've done over the past year, uh, are available at our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. So, uh, Lara, Darius, and Jen, thanks for joining us today. Uh, now's the time for you to offer uh, any closing words. Yeah, Darius, did you have your hand up? Why don't you go ahead? Oh, no, I think uh, Patricia, uh, she was waving and I was just waving back, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but since, 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 I, I, guess, I, I guess since I'm already off mute, um, I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah, Patty is one of the founders of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. So anyway, good, yeah, go ahead, Darius. Um, so, so again, um, thank you all for, for joining and thank you so much, Michael and, and everyone for having me. And um, I really enjoyed, enjoyed this discussion. Um, like I said before, it's been so long since I've, I've been in uh, New Mexico with Laura and Jen. So it's really good seeing their face, even though it is a Zoom call. Um, and um, it's really good seeing all of your faces as well. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and, and just the last thing I will say, um, and it's, it's a little bit funny, but uh, how I think about organizing is like a bag of popcorn in the microwave. Like you'll get some of those kernels that will pop automatically. You'll get some kernels that'll pop, you know, in the middle of, of the session. And then you'll have some kernels that just won't pop at all. 
but everybody goes into the bowl. Everything goes into the bowl. So you can't forget anybody, even if people aren't going to agree with you, understand that they're all human beings and we all deserve an opportunity and a chance. So that's what I'm going to leave with. Thanks so much, Darius. Uh, Laura, you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. Um, it's so lovely to see Darius and Jen. It's been such a long time and I miss them both and everyone that we made this film with. So it's always great to see everyone's faces and it's lovely to see all of your faces as well. I'm on my phone, so I haven't been able to see all of your faces as well as I'd like to, but I really appreciate you being here and having this discussion. Um, it's so nice to connect when, you know, it's been over a year of, you know, isolation. Um, and I guess that's all, I don't have anything to plug. So thank you very much. And I wish everyone, you know, rigorousness and steadfastness in, in the struggles. Blessings on your studies uh, at uh, in Jerusalem at Hebrew University. And Darius, I think I speak for all of us who are still on here mm -hmm. that we send our prayers and blessings and uh, comforting condolences on the death of your dad. Jen? I say a word about Donkey Saddle and uh, uh, the rest of your work in Darfur, on Darfur and, and other work that you do and uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been so wonderful to be, uh, for the opportunity to be in conversation um, with all of you and, and to be able to do that jointly. Darius and Lara with you has been like a, literally a heartwarming treat. Like I literally feel my heart warming from seeing you um, and being here together. And so really appreciate the work of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and that you're creating the space for these really vital conversations. Um, and so uh, that's just deeply appreciated. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to um, share more about Donkey Saddle Projects. We're a tiny grassroots organization, tiny but growing. Uh, and we exist in, we, our work is in that space with, um, between uh, art and storytelling and movement building and activism. Um, our belief as you saw reflected in in the film is that um, art and storytelling have a really important role to play in liberation work uh, and in movement work and that and that um, making sure that stories are told and that people's lives are honored um, is is a fun is a fundamental part of the work that we're doing and that art has a as a way of being able to facilitate and foster relationships uh, that is the foundation of movement building and it also has the ability to nurture the, the kind of radical imagination that will be required for us to envision a different path forward um, and how things might be and and so that so that is what the work is of donkey saddle projects um there is a lot that we are doing right now um if you fill out that form um that we've dropped the link to a couple times then we can add you to our email list and you can be getting uh our updates some of the projects that we're working on right now we we just started something called the Abolition Project, um, which is headed by my colleague, Sherelle Brown. We're about to launch a, a political education series called Abolition Learning Circles, which will be for artists and cultural workers to dive into questions about what abolition actually means and looks like. Uh, we're working on a play. We're partnering with um, activist Alejandro Pablos, who spent two years, over two years, in ICE detention and is now um, fighting deportation orders. Um, and so we're we're creating an immersive theatrical experience around her story and her time, um, particularly the two years in ICE detention. Um, we're creating a documentary film around Troy Davis's story as, um, as it was performed by people most directly impacted by the death penalty and by the criminal punishment system. Um, that's just a little slice of what we're doing. Uh, there's a lot more, but um, our website, you can go to it, but it's also hasn't been updated in like three years and we're in the process of rebuilding it. So if you go there now, you will see an accurate representation of Donkey Saddle Project circa 2019 or 2018. Um, but in a few months, <laughs> it'll be um, it'll be our updated site. But but really getting us our e uh, your email address and allowing us to then um, send those update emails will be the best way to, to keep in touch with our work. Oh, and for folks who are interested um, in knowing more about this hike that I'm about to embark on, this is a different link that says more about what the hike is about and, and who we're who we're supporting through uh, through this hike. Um, so I get on the trail tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah, and you're taking what? Uh, uh, 
you're taking some time off to do what a couple of months is it uh how long uh, it, it, it it'll be about seven? it'll be about six weeks uh it'll uh, about five weeks of hiking and then i have some buffer time built in just in case you know i have if i twist an ankle i have time to rest it and things like that well jen uh, the reaction and the response from the people who saw the film or either throughout last week or today has been overwhelming. Uh, um, we, we watched it with uh, gratitude uh, uh, for a seal and his life and witness uh, for you and your creativity and bringing it to life on the screen for us, for Darius and Lara and all the, uh, uh, I'm gonna speak for myself here, the young activists who, as Jerry has pointed out before, are picking up the mantle uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the next, well, in my case, two generations uh, uh, from now. But anyway, uh, Darius, Lara, blessings to you on your uh, continued activism and work. Uh, Jen, thank you uh, to you. So thanks, thank everyone, you. for tuning in today.